All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for the most recent installment of a webinar brought to you by A Mind for All Seasons and the Summit at Sunland Springs. It is on depression, anxiety, and stress, alternative ways to navigate the senior storm. My name is Lori Marsh. I am the marketing director over at the Summit at Sunland Springs in Mesa, Arizona. Just come on in, get yourself comfortable, and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Feel free to add any questions into the chat box or go ahead and give us some feedback about where you are joining us from and what brings you to this program. If you're looking for something for a loved one or if you're involved in the senior industry or healthcare industry, we'd love to be able to make this a conversation. Some of the best webinars are those that we have some great questions and we're able to engage with our presenters. And for just uh, a couple more minutes, we'll be joining, um, everybody will be joining us this presentation will also be recorded, so we'll be emailing it out after the event in order if you want to forward it on to someone or if you want to watch the information again, it'll be available to you. I love it when I have Randy and Eric uh, chatting back to participants. All right, we'll just wait another minute. All right, without further ado, let me say thank you so much for joining us for the upcoming presentation on depression, anxiety, and stress, alternative ways to navigate the senior storm. My name is Lori Marsh. I'm the marketing director at the summit at Sunland Springs. We're so excited to be bringing to you some very interesting presentations. Uh, this one we have is a brand new one put together by A Mind for All Seasons. That is Eric Collette. Eric, give a little wave. Hello. Uh, we have Randy Vaudry joining us with A Mind for All Seasons and Robson Flynn our memory coach here at the summit at Sunland Springs. Eric Collette is the principal and CEO of A Mind for All Seasons, is a nationally recognized speaker, consultant, and dementia expert, a licensed residential care administrator, and a teacher at Boise State University and the College of Western Idaho. Eric passionately believes that lifelong learning is the key to finding powerful new solutions to significant challenges and has been working to change lives through innovative dementia care techniques, program development, and leadership strategies since 2000. Randy Vaudry is the Chief Medical Officer at A Mind for All Seasons, a nurse practitioner with extensive experience in hospital, skilled nursing, psychiatric care, and primary care settings. He joined A Mind for All Seasons in 2017 to collaborate on the production, training, and delivery of assessment tools and treatment protocols that improve the lives and functional capacity of those living with Alzheimer's disease, other types of dementia. Randy's endeavors have formed the bulk of the Enhanced Protocol, a Mind for All Seasons signature product. Much of his work has been influenced by the research of Dr. Dale Bredesen, a pioneering neurologist an Alzheimer's researcher from whom Randy has received training in techniques to improve cognitive functioning. Robson Flynn, the memory coach at the summit at Sunland Springs, has been helping seniors with dementia in various roles for the better part of a decade. He has spearheaded the enhanced protocol at the summit since its inception over two years ago. Before that, he worked on redesigning our memory care resident program focusing on stimulating residents cognitively, emotionally, and physically. 
And without further ado, I want to go ahead and send it on over to Eric and Randy to kick us off on our presentation on depression, anxiety, and stress in seniors. Please feel free again to chat any feedback, any questions in the chat box, and we will make sure that we address them. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, and thank you for attending today. It's wonderful to have you with us. Now, as you can tell from the title of the presentation, we're focused a lot on the senior storm. How do we help people deal with the fact that, as one person once said it, the golden years are laced with lead. And a lot of people live in worry of the, their uh, brain fog getting worse or their depression or anxiety that runs in the family rearing its ugly head in their situation. Notwithstanding the fact that we want to help you see some things differently when it comes to seniors and senior care, everybody has to deal with the fact that we all have a brain. And there are many different ways that the brain can be affected. Many of us, as we go through life, have or will experience depression or anxiety um, or stress. I mean, just look at the world around us. We, we all have experienced a lot of stress lately. So we hope that you not only learn some interesting things related to senior care, but also to self-care, that you come away from this knowing some things that you can start doing or some questions that you could start asking and exploring that will help you understand yourself better. Now, it may seem a little bit crazy to do this, but I'm going to introduce the topic today with a story about a young woman in her early 20s, because I think it'll kind of frame for you a little bit different way of viewing depression and anxiety and stress. So I had a friend call me several months back and it was Saturday afternoon. I was out working in my yard and this friend said, Eric, I got to talk to you. And he went on to describe the devastating situation that his daughter was in. His daughter was in her early 20s. And from the time she was 12, she had been depressed, anxious, and at times very suicidal to the point that not too long before she had found herself standing on top of a 14-story building ready to leap. It was that serious. They had taken her to countless doctors. And although they were most happy with the primary care provider she was with at the time because that provider had kind of helped her make a little bit of progress and, and at least not be quite so suicidal. He said, we want our daughter back. When she was younger, she was fun. She was exciting. She, she would be the life of the party. She would joke around with us. And there are so many times that he said she would just sit in her room and not come out, sometimes for days. He said, I realize that what you do is focused on people improving their brains so that they either don't develop Alzheimer's disease or so that you help people that have serious dementia get just a little bit better. But do you think that there's something that your approach might be able to do for my daughter? And I said, I don't know. We, we don't spend a ton of time with that, but we do have an ace up our sleeve. And that's the fact that Randy, our chief medical officer, has run a mental health practice for years and he does have a lot of experience supporting people. And he understands both the traditional side of medicine that her primary care doctor has been trying to work through with her. And he understands a more root cause functional medicine type of approach. And if you can live with the fact that we haven't done a ton of work as a company, specifically with people in your daughter's situation, man, we'll roll up our sleeves and we will get to work. Well, here we are months later. And over the Christmas holiday, he sent me a text message and he showed a picture of her interacting with her mother with a gift that she had given her mom that just was making her mom laugh. And she was laughing and there was even a little video that he sent after that. And it was so refreshing. And he said in that text message that he was sending, the very best gift that we got this Christmas is that we got our daughter back. She's her again. She's, she's laughing. She's teasing us. She's engaging. She hasn't solved every challenge that she faces in life, but she's back. And I'm here to tell you the approaches that Randy's going to talk to you about today are the things that have been absolutely key in helping her add to the good that her other doctor was doing 
and, and take more and enlarge the picture of why she was struggling so much. So I hope that sets the context just a little bit. Randy is going to take the rest of the presentation here because he's really the genius behind pulling all these pieces together. So I know you'll get a lot out of it. Please continue asking questions and making comments as we go in the chat, because I know Randy's gonna save some time at the end, but we can have a discussion with you and talk about how these things might apply to people in your own lives, might apply to you directly, or people that you're serving professionally. So thanks again for being along for the ride. Randy, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, as Eric mentioned, I have uh, owned a mental health company for several years. And Eric, I'm, I'm working to try to get my slides to change and they're not shifting. So let me make sure that everyone can see my slides here. So yeah, try it again. You might have to click okay. on the slide itself. Yep, I reloaded it, it came. Okay, so you'll see this is uh, my current website for uh, my mental health practice. It's called Physicians Care Centers and we have a mental health service. And I have served as the psychiatric nurse practitioner for a mental health hospital for several years. And then I was a staff nurse practitioner and so I feel um, confident managing medicines and mental health. But the purpose of our discussion today is to talk about all the novel things or non-pharmaceutical things that we can do to help make people feel a little bit better. Before I do that, I wanna talk about what is considered conventional medicine, right? If you feel terribly depressed or you have a loved one that's depressed, what are the tools that we have in mental health to get you through that? And it's basically prescription medicine and talk therapy. And there's lots of different kinds of talk therapy, right? EMDR and cognitive behavioral therapy, there's lots. Grief counseling is a big part of that. And in really severe cases, we admit people to the hospital. We use lots of uh, medicines and heavy doses of medicines. And sometimes we even do shock therapy. Along my treatment perspective or perspective over time, I began thinking, God, what are we missing? There's gotta be more than just medicines. And I'm kind of a studious guy, so I started reading and I became familiar with this book called A Mind of Her Own, written by a psychiatrist in New York City named Kelly Brogan. Now, Kelly Brogan sells herself as an integrative psychiatrist, looking at integrative therapies to manage chronic depression. Now, this intrigued me because it went far beyond the use of pharmaceutical medicines. And as you dig into Dr. Brogan's website, she lists case study after case study about how to manage bipolar disease or tapering off psychiatric medicines in a very strategic and methodical way, healing dissociative disorder, right? Multiple personalities. Those are not things that you read about. In fact, most of the time, in conventional medicine, we discourage people from even considering tapering off their medicines out of the risk that they're gonna do worse. And I've often thought, well, if they're doing terrible in the first place, why wouldn't we consider something else? So this particular website really intrigued me. And as I got into studying, I realized there was a lot of doctors that talked about novel therapeutic interventions for depression, anxiety, bipolar disease, mood disorder, schizophrenia, and it's all over the place. But for some reason in school, they only taught me how to prescribe a drug. And so I've spent the last 15, 16 years of my practice really identifying what are some of those novel therapeutic treatments that we can do. Dr. James Greenblatt He's no uh, small potato, as we say in Idaho, right? This guy's an Ivy League, trained, Ivy League trained physician in psychiatry, both adult and pediatrics, talking about functional ways to manage depression and anxiety. So if I go back to my first slide, there's the conventional method on the left side of your screen. And then there's a lot of other things that you can do in addition to. They don't have to be in lieu of or in place of medicines, but we can actually do them together with the management of medicine. And I wanna start today's message by sharing with you an experience that I had with a 16 year old man that went, or 16 year old boy that went to one of the local high schools. 
His father brought him into my mental health clinic and he's dragging his head down and dad's doing all of the talking, right? I've seen this a million times in mental health. And dad said, my son feels like killing himself and he needs help. And so we brought him in and the dad says, we specifically brought him to you because we know that you'll think outside of the pharmaceutical box. Can you help us think of things that we can do? And we're not opposed to medicines, the dad said, but we just wanna be able to, to think broad. And I said, of course. In the midst of that discussion, the conversation about what's your son, what do you eat? And when I asked that question, it was like the body language in the room changed and the son turned away from his dad, his dad sitting on this side, the son turned away, didn't wanna look at his dad and his dad, chuckles and says, oh my gosh, what does he eat? Well, let me tell you what he eats. He eats three things. He eats Pop-Tarts, Top Ramen, and Mac and Cheese. And this has been such a fight in our home that in our pantry, we just cleared a shelf on the top of our pantry and we just loaded it with every flavor of Pop-Tart, Top Ramen, and Mac and Cheese. And that's all that my son eats. And I could see they had fought battles about this. And so I said, well, let's talk about what, how we could adjust that. And as we got into the discussion, it reminded me of some studies that show that there is an association between food and mood. And there's a lot of association between food and mood, specifically in the pediatric population. Now, I want you to know my personality, right? I like to have a pretty good time and, and talk about how, uh, talk about fun things that make medicine fun, but I always have to bring people back to the warnings as well. Because if food can predict mood, and then we look at what medicines does, I want you to look at this particular slide. This slide talks about, there's a black box warning from the FDA about using um, SSRI medicines, and I, I picked Zoloft, but you can pick anyone, it doesn't matter that there's a risk of suicidal thinking in pediatric populations that take this medicine. And so I'm faced with this dilemma to think, how do I start medicines on a young person knowing that the side effect of the medicine could be suicidal thinking, or do I go a different route? So I began to focus a little bit more on food. And I told this young man, my goal is that every day you eat something fresh, raw, whole, organic and colorful during that day. Not every meal, just once a day, right? We're gonna start low and slow, just like we would if we were starting a medicine. And I told him, I don't care what color it is. I don't care if it's a fruit or a vegetable. I don't care if it has sugar or if it's a fiber. My only requirement is that it not be altered or processed. So you can't have applesauce and tell me that you ate an apple or you can't have fruit snacks and tell me that you had a piece of fruit. You actually have to eat a piece of fruit. And my preference is it's not be cooked. I just want it to be whole and fresh and raw. And then I spent a little bit of time just talking to the family about how nutrients in food are often predicted by their colors. And that's why I said, please get different colors. If he ate a banana every single day of his life, we miss an opportunity to get the beta carotenes and bioflavonoids that come from oranges. And we missed the opportunity to get the antioxidants that come from blueberries. So I just said, you know what? I'm not gonna micromanage you. I just wanna encourage something fresh, whole, raw, or organic. And I would ask you to try to eat the rainbow, get lots of colors of food. Well, I'll tell you what was pretty fascinating about this young man is that at his follow-up visit, he was visibly different. Now he came with his dad the first time, he didn't come with his dad the second time, but he looked different. Just like you look at this tree, one tree looks like it's dying and the other one looks like it's alive. He was smiling with me, he joked with me. What was originally introverted was now extroverted. He asked me questions about his diet. He says, now I tried to eat broccoli and cabbage, but I don't really like those. So could I eat these? And we just had this really delightful conversation. And at the end, I said, well, what do you think? How are you feeling? And he says, man, I can't tell you how much better I feel. It's amazing the difference. And I said, well, you know, how could we expand this? Could you try to eat something fresh or whole or raw at every meal, not just once a day? And he says, oh my, I'm trying to do that. One year later after that visit, I was at my daughter's soccer game 
and I got a tap on the shoulder and I turn around and there's this young man and he just gave me a hug and he says, Hey, I just wanted to thank you. I'm doing so good. I feel so great. And we talked again about how he had changed his lifestyle and it changed his mood. Now I was at a business lecture and seminar not too long ago. And I was reminded of another doctor who talked about this called the doctor's pharmacy. Now this doctor right here is very well known. He's the director of functional medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. And he runs a podcast called the doctor's pharmacy. And it's not P-H-A-R-M, like we would think pharmaceutical. It's how we fix people with food. Speaking of the doctor's pharmacy coming from Whole Foods. Okay. Uh, another business seminar that I went to, someone showed me this video and I got such a kick out of it. I wanted to share it with you. So uh, it's a little salty, but I think it'll make you smile. Enjoy. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. I'm Melissa Moore, author of Holy <laughs> A Brief History of Swearing. A recent study by Kraft Mac and Cheese revealed that 74% of moms say they've sworn in front of their kids. If you're one of the 26% who say they've never sworn in front of their kids, you're full of <laughs> Anyway, I'm here to show you how to avoid some of these not-so-perfect parenting situations. For example, when your kids are running around like caffeinated gorillas when you're trying to make a web video, you might say, what the frog? You're acting like flipping goof nuggets. Take that horse hockey outside. Instead of, calm the down and get your little outside. Or you can say, get off your monkey flunking tablet and get your shit talky mushrooms ready for soccer practice. When you really want to say, move your and get your together for soccer, you're gonna be out. I meant son of a motherless goat. No parent is perfect, but sometimes you can do better. That's why I'm here. Other times you can't, and that's why there's Kraft Mac and Cheese. Sugar, I said sugar. Sometimes we just have to swear, and that's okay. Nobody's perfect. You're a mom, and it's Mother's Day. I'm Melissa Moore, and here's to swearing like a mother. Oh, poot, I almost forgot. For a special Mother's Day gift, go to swearlikeamother.com. Happy Mother's Day. Now, I hope that that doesn't offend anyone. I told you it's a little bit salty. But the thing that makes me smile is that this was produced by Kraft Mac and Cheese. And their punchline at the end is, hey, we can't always be perfect. And on those days that you can't be perfect, we got Kraft Mac and Cheese for you. And I think it's so funny. It means they can laugh at themselves. They recognize Kraft Mac and Cheese is not the staple. It's not what's going to drive health. But sometimes you just got to live life. You got to go with the flow. And so I would encourage all of you, laugh at this and recognize that we all eat Kraft Mac and cheese once in a while. We don't eat perfect. We got to eat out. We got to eat fast food once in a while. But make no mistake, diet matters and food will predict your mood. Happy I'm going to go on to the next one and talk just a little bit about glycotoxicity. Now, you might think glycotoxicity, what does that mean? It's actually a, a, a reference to how much sugar we consume in the diet and how toxic it becomes to our body. And I'm gonna talk particularly about the brain. Um, this brain that we have being just little, right? Mine smaller than most, consumes between 20 and 30% of all of the calories that we eat in a day. Now think about that. If you eat, if I eat 2000 calories in a day, probably two, uh, excuse me, Four to 500 of those calories are burned by have thinking, just brain function. And so cal caloric load is a driver of thinking. And then if a person has insulin resistance or prediabetes or glycotoxicity, that is a driver of inflammation in the brain. And we have very poor production of energy and we get brain foggy. And you can ask any diabetic what it feels like when their blood sugars start dropping. Man, they do not feel good. They can't think clearly. And many of them get confused. You can say the exact same thing when their blood sugar gets very, very elevated. And so managing blood sugar at an even kill makes a huge difference in our total health. 
And in this slide, I took the diagnostic criteria for insulin resistance and I compared it to the diagnostic criteria for depression. When someone comes to the doctor, we can't draw their blood and look for an enzyme and say, oh my goodness, you've got depression. I can see it in your blood. We don't do that, but we do ask questions. We might say, number one, are you depressed? Do you have a sleep disorder? Do you feel a loss of energy or do you feel fatigued or guilty or you have poor concentration or has your appetite changed, right? We ask these questions. And if, an, if a person answers yes to enough of those questions, then by the American Psychiatric Association, we can formally diagnose a depressive disorder. But look at the crossover with insulin resistance, fatigue, poor energy, brain fog, lack of motivation. These are all signs and symptoms that come with insulin resistance. So make no mistake, oftentimes we think we're, depreting, we're treating a depression, what we actually might be treating is an insulin resistance. The brain, has to have fuel to be able to think clearly. And that fuel can come from glucose, it can from, come from ketones, and it can come from lactate. These are all, and I've circled them, this is a very technical slide, and, and I pulled this off this pharmaceutical website, but I just want you to know that an individual who has terrible insulin resistance, where they're diabetic, you basically eliminate one of those sources of energy for the brain. No wonder they feel demented and foggy. I can tell you uh, from both research and experience that insulin resistance and diabetes is the number one cause of dementia worldwide, right? Not only does glucose and toxic, glycotoxicity cause inflammation in the brain, but there's other causes of inflammation in the brain. And you might all think to yourself, well, inflammation in the brain, I know what happens when my joints get swollen and when my back is sore, I know there's inflammation, but how do you predict inflammation in your head? And let me give you some examples here and, and I'll just go quickly. If you've ever had a cold sore or if you've ever had Epstein-Barr virus or you've had a bad dental infection, you're transmitting inflammation right up into the brain head injuries and concussions. We've already talked about blood sugar and diet. They all make a huge difference for cognitive disorders. Um, though it's very similar to how food can predict our mood, if we dig a little deeper, we can talk about nutrient depletion or nutrient deficiency and depression. And I pulled up this slide. This is actually a public service announcement from the Philippines encouraging women who are pregnant to take a multivitamin that has folic acid. Now, I'm guessing that just about everyone on our discussion today is aware that if, you, that if you're pregnant, you need to take folic acid because it helps to prevent um, neural tube defects, which is basically brain damage in a growing child. Well, I would propose the question, how is that any different as we age? Do you think that our folic acid need goes down once we're born? Uh-uh. And I'll give you an example of this. I had an individual that came into my office. You'll see my name is on the upper right-hand corner, corner is the attending healthcare provider. He had terrible bipolar disorder and he was all over the map. This poor guy was so impaired. And I was asking about his diet and his nutrition and I asked him if I could do some blood work. Well, I drew a homocysteine level and we draw homocysteine levels all the time in the dementia world, but they're not drawn very often in the mental health world. His homocysteine was 178. Now I have taken this to all of my healthcare providers. I have 14 full-time employees that are nurse practitioners, PAs, or physicians. And I asked them, have you ever seen a homocysteine level this high? And all of them say, oh my gosh, I have never, ever seen that. And you'll see that was back in 2018. Um, this person was so vitamin B12 and folic acid deficient that he, he was seriously mentally ill because of it. Here's another patient that we had tremendous success in managing his bipolar disease by helping to manage his folate status, and we used a marker called homocysteine to manage it. So in the box that's in red, you'll see that in November of 2008, his homocysteine was 43. 
and I started a B vitamin with folic acid. In June, his folic acid went to 31. And then again, in September of 2020, this was the last time I saw him, it was down to 21. When I first met this young man, he couldn't stop drinking. He had purchased a car, a great big jacked up pickup truck on 16% interest because his credit was so bad. He went to a predatory lender and got a loan. I mean, it was tragic how this came about. Over this time, I, I've helped manage his medicine and helped him and helped his spouse. He's gotten married. He's enrolled in college. He's doing amazing. And I can tell you, we've been lowering his medicine, not adding medicine to it. We've actually been lowering it. And you'll see that up here on this screen, I begged him no alcohol because alcohol will further deplete his vitamin B12 and his folic acid status. So this is a classic. There's two really good case examples of how nutrient optimization, specifically vitamin B1, B6, B9, B12, vitamin D, K2, magnesium, amino acids, these are essential for improving cognitive function. Another one of my favorite authors in the genre of amino acids and mental health, her name is Julia Ra. She's out of California and she's a PhD psychologist. She has managed mental illness with high dose amino acid therapy. Now amino acids are things, you've probably heard of some of these amino acids, L-theanine, um, alpha lipoic acid, um, uh, L-tyrosine. Uh, there's just a whole bunch that help manage cognitive uh, problems like depression, anxiety, mood disorders. I can't think, I can't concentrate, ADD, ADHD. She actually has some questionnaires in her book where you can fill out a questionnaire and she'll tell you what amino acid to start using. I've used some of her research and have seen great benefits. Another one of my favorite authors named Daniel Amen, he has a clinic right here in Arizona. It's called the Amen Clinic. And he, his kind of claim to fame is that he will do spec scans of the brain and he'll look at metabolic pathways in the brain. And he's very big on nutritional supplements and nootropics, amino acids like we talked about. And the nice thing is like me, he still believes in conventional medicine. He has no fear of prescribing antidepressants and mood stabilizers and sleep medicine when they're warranted but the beauty is they don't become the crutch and they're not the only tool that he uses. Um, you see that I circled on here that he talks about seven types of ADD. This book resonated with me because um, I've studied Dr. Bredesen who has subtyped dementia. Instead of saying there's only Alzheimer's dementia, he subtypes it into these different groups, inflammatory and atrophic, glycotoxic. So, Daniel Amen is a fantastic author that I've really resonated with. Another thing, another intervention that I think is so essential, particularly to the women, if you're a female and you're listening to this presentation, I want you to be really thoughtful about hormones, especially if you're middle-aged or trending into menopause, because women who trend into menopause are more likely to have anxiety and depression and sleep disorder. And my general rule is we always optimize hormones before we rush into an SSRI or a mood stabilizer and an antidepressant. And many women don't need that. I had a, a telemedicine consultation yesterday with a gal whose husband, they were on family vacation in Hawaii and a large wave came and crashed down on her husband and it broke his neck and he passed away from that injury. Think of the trauma that she must have felt. I met her for the first time in September of 2020. Now she's holed up at her house because of COVID and she can't go anywhere. I mean, she just bawled the entire visit, tearful for 30 straight minutes. I felt so bad for her. Do you know what we did? We put her on estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. And I did a telemedicine consult with her yesterday and she's joking and laughing. And she said, Randy, this has changed my life. I can't, why didn't I start this earlier? I can't believe someone didn't talk to me about hormone replacement. It's not a fix all cure all, but it should always be considered. Remember that your hormones, when we talk about hormones, really we talk about the neuroendocrine system. 
the neural meaning your brain and the endocrine meaning hormone, those hormones come up and have an impact in our brain. And then it predicts the hormones that are released throughout our body. This is a great analogy to talk about that neuroendocrine system. Dr. Avram Blooming and uh, his partner in crime wrote a book called Estrogen Matters. And if you look at that subtitle, it says, while taking hormones in menopause can improve women's well-being and lengthen their lives without the risk of breast cancer. And man, we've been told over and over, hormones are too dangerous and there's major risk. Look, just like everything, there's risk. I showed you earlier on in this presentation that if you take an antidepressant, you have a greater risk of suicidal ideation, especially in pediatric populations. So how is it that we see the risk in hormones, but we don't see the risk in other things? Honestly, that, that strikes a nerve with me. I have to be really careful about that. I wanna play another video. This is a nurse practitioner that calls on the assisted living center. And here's, this, here's the brief story. She contacted me and she says, I've got a patient with dementia who sits and yells all day long, help me, help me, help me. No conversation, very disruptive. Randy, is there anything that we could do for her? And I said, let's optimize her hormones. I'm gonna let you hear it from her. I met this lady and <laughs> took a look at her med list. And um, she, up till that day, she had been on, um, I counted six antipsychotics. So we were on numerous uh, antipsychotics, anti-anxieties, uh, you know, normal run-of-the-mill drugs, Seroquel, uh, there was Buspar, Depakote, uh, anyway, a whole list of meds. And uh, basically what had been, what had happened is she broke a hip, uh, went in for surgery, came out, uh, and was just not the same again. And it had exacerbated uh, her cognitive status. She was, you know, yelling all day long, repetitive words, help me, um, uh, help me, and um, are you ready yet? These really familiar, just same uh same phrases over and over and over. So she was disruptive to others. She was disruptive to anyone around her. They couldn't really bring her in for activities. So the, the provider before me had just basically given her a med and then another med and another med, trying to control this, this behavior that nobody could really get a handle on. So uh, basically medicated her up to the point where she was just... Um, not able to function or eat, drink, et cetera. And that had been maybe 24 hours before I got there. So packed her up, moved her over to Summit, took her off of virtually everything she was on, minus a few like mirtazapine and um, uh, a Xanax. Uh, otherwise, all the rest of the meds, uh, she couldn't swallow anyway. So we were, we were fighting a, a, that battle regardless. So she couldn't swallow. Uh, so we figured, well, if we could get anything in her, this is what we would try to get in her. So <clears throat> along with the blood pressure med. So anyway, got her over to Summit. It was a Hail Mary. Daughter's like, I will just, let's just, whatever you do, if the outcome is still that she ends up on hospice or she passes or she, you know, she, she we have a, a, you know, we go down that path, that's okay too. This is truly just, we are at the end of the rope anyway. So got her over there, took her off all of her meds, couple, she couldn't walk, she couldn't move, she couldn't do anything. Within 24, 48 hours, she started drinking. She started eating. Um, we were able to sit her up. Uh, that was just weaning her off all the meds. Got her down to just, like I said, the few, a few, two, and then the rest of her baseline meds. Uh, another couple of weeks, another week or two passed and she was now sitting up and back to the yelling. You know, we've so had it Karen, can I interrupt real quick? Yeah. Uh, at what point did you did you and I speak about some ideas for next steps? So four weeks into about two two to three weeks into this, I called you, and I said, "Hey, this lady wants wants the program, but she's so far, you know, into this process. I don't. You didn't think. I didn't think. We didn't think there was really any chance. So that's when you mentioned the hormones. So by this point, though, I had therapy in there. She was walking, but she was still with this yelling so she couldn't be in a group she couldn't she could participate she was in her room with a private caregiver all day long for the whole entire day just yelling are you ready 
uh, talked to you, started her on the hormones. Uh, it's been about, I, like I said, about three weeks after the hormones were started that uh, we started to notice she could start calming and less yelling and more engaging. And then last week it was, she's participating in activities. I carried on a full blown conversation with her and she's like a new woman. I, we're all just kind of just shocked, could not believe the outcome of estrogen. What was it? The, the combination cream and the uh, uh, progesterone estrogen, et cetera. So anyway. Okay. So in that summary, you'll see that this lady had taken truckloads of psych meds and done worse and worse and worse. And the one thing we did was we stopped about, I think we stopped six medicines and we added a topical hormone cream and one hormone, one hormone at night called progesterone. And it took about three weeks and she was a new woman. And Karen called me. The reason I recorded that conversation is Karen called me and said, Randy, what happened? How did that happen? Like, this is too good to be true. And that engaged in a conversation or that initiated a conversation of, look, we don't use hormones enough for mood disorders and cognitive dysfunction. Karen, after that, asked me if I would hold some training for a whole group of nurse practitioners that call an assisted living center so they can optimize hormones and get the benefits out of them. It's amazing. I'm going to shift gears for we're almost done. And then I want to be able to take your questions. Um, in addition to hormones and diet and nutrition and inflammation and glycotoxicity, you've got to pay attention to people's guts. Their, their GI system matters. And we live in an environment where when our guts are bad, we take um, anti-reflux medicine. We've used antibiotics like crazy, which has kind of injured the bacteria that's in our gut. We got chronic irritable bowel and diarrhea and constipation. You know what I hear a lot? I hear a lot of people come in and say, hey, my mom is obsessed about her bowel movements. Like that's all she talks about. She turns 70 years old and she can't talk about anything about except for when she has a bowel movement. And I think to myself, we got to focus on that. If we make her guts better, we'll make everything better. And I don't know if, if you're aware of this. Um, hold on just a sec. I got to, my, my screen stopped sharing for just a second. So I have to go back and do it again. And for some reason, when I click off something, that's what happens. So most people don't realize that if you have a bad gut, you're predictably going to have a bad brain. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, a lot of the serotonin in our body is made in the GI system. I'm going to say that again. We take medicines like Prozac and Zoloft and Celebrex, or not Celebrex, Celexa. These medicines try to improve or increase serotonin in our bodies. Did you know that if the majority of the serotonin in your body is made by the bacteria in your gut. And if you just focus on improving your GI health, there's a good chance that cognitively you're going to feel a little bit better. That's amazing, right? This is that, this is that quote that 90% of the serotonin is actually made in the gut. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I want to take some questions, is that I don't think we spend enough time talking about toxins and depression. And you might think, well, what do you mean toxins? We live in a very clean society, especially now with COVID. My gosh, we sanitize everything, right? How can we have toxins? Trust me, they are all over the place. And I want to give you an example of a man who's 69 years old when I first met him. And he came to us because he had some memory problems but he didn't have Alzheimer's dementia. His, his neurologist called it kind of like a Parkinson's, but it didn't match all the, the criteria for Parkinson's disease. My business partner, Eric, is brilliant. And he says, Randy, he's got toxicity. Uh, I hadn't yet met him, but he says, I think we should do some toxin testing. So we did some mercury level testing. Now I want you to look at this. This yellow line on the this first bar, the yellow line is his organic mercury level that comes from fish or eating fish laden with mercury. In the second box, that second yellow line is his mercury level 
that's called an inorganic mercury. So this is the type of mercury that might come from a filling, a dental filling that's been oxidized and broken. The very last box is his total mercury level. And you'll see his total mercury level was absolutely at toxic levels in September of 2019. We did a very gentle detox over six months using over-the-counter supplements. And that blue box shows how low his mercury level dropped. It was amazing. We recently met with him within the last 30 days and he said, you know what? I've noticed that I'm still crisp and sharp in my mood. I'd like to remarry. I'd like to have a partner, but sometimes I'm not very nice. And I think that we're on the right track of fixing me, And I, but I, I don't think we're there yet. We have more to do. And I thought that was so insightful of him that he's recognized that toxicity played a big role in his cognitive disorders. So this slide is very busy and it's probably too confusing, but let me just point this out. In blue are those things that we do in traditional psychiatry. We prescribe medicines like mood stabilizers and SSRIs and sleep medicines, and we do talk therapy. And I can't say anything bad about those interventions. I think they have their place. But I feel it's tragic when there's so many other things that we could consider as an intervention to help improve mental health. And we tell patients, or we, we don't even give them the option. We never talk about hormones or gut health or toxicity or dietary or nutritional interventions as if that stuff didn't matter. I'm here to tell you it matters big time and it can predict the way we improve people's mental health. With that in mind, I'd like to wrap up and just take some questions from everyone. Uh, I don't want to just dominate the time like a lecture, but there's probably some questions going along. Uh, let me turn the time over to our moderator, either Lori or Eric, and, and take some of your questions. Randy, thank you so much. This has been very interesting. I mean, I have had a number of presentations with you both. And I continue to learn something each time and really how, how so much is um, reliant on each other. One thing can contribute to the next. And I definitely know in this time of COVID, I have not exercised nearly as much as I normally would have. And I am not eating as good as I used to. So that gut contributing to my mood, it's a, it's a true thing. Um, I do want to make sure that we get an opportunity to introduce Robeson. Robeson Flynn is our memory coach here at the summit at Sunland Springs. And our topic that we were talking about today is depression and mood and anxiety in seniors, but it also obviously um, everything that Randy was mentioning can be in teens, can be in adults, you can use it across um, the, the board. But one thing that we have here at the summit at Sunland Springs is our outpatient memory clinic. And one thing that we have realized with seniors um, or people that have some cognitive decline, that there's an opportunity to work on their, um, not only their brain, but being able to improve their um, gut and their overall health. And so I want to invite Robeson to speak a little bit about what happens over at the memory clinic and how um, the diet contributes to the overall health and wellness. Absolutely. So I have seen amazing things happen with just tweaking even so much as diet. Um, we had a gentleman who was on a steady diet of products manufactured by the Hormel Corporation. So, you know, those little complete meals, spam, chili, anything that came in a box or a can, he was, he was down for it. And he had horrible depression. He had horrible anxiety. Um, he came to our community, uh, wasn't even on the enhanced protocol, just got a better diet into him. And wouldn't you know that depression and anxiety over the span of about a month completely resolved itself. Um, you know, other things like, you know, someone who was to the point where 
in their own words, they wanted to die. Um, you know, we fixed the, you know, this was a more of a, a glycotoxic issue and, and an inflammatory issue. But, you know, we went from that to, you know, down getting dinner, you know, speaking in a much better tone to their spouse. Um, you know, that was a really, really difficult time. You know, their spouse was, this is not the man I married. Um, I don't know what's going on. Um, but we were able to, by fixing those issues, completely change their personality back to the person that they, they were 20 years ago. You know, Robeson, as you talk about that, I, I was thinking when I made this presentation, I didn't even include things like exercise. I talked nothing about audiovisual entrainment, red light therapy, some of the modalities that we have used with um, the enhanced protocol. And I intentionally did that because I wanted to talk about things that every person, regardless of where they lived or what their financial status was, these are all things that people could capture. But would you not agree that we lift out just as many things that we could have included in this presentation that can enhance uh, depression? Absolutely. We had a gentleman speaking to audiovisual entrainment. We had a gentleman who lost his wife. Um, she sadly had um, Alzheimer's disease and he was at a point where he was talking about, you know, ending it. And we used uh, audiovisual entrainment to really get him through that really, really rough patch. Um, and he's out in the, the, the world and happy today. And, um, yeah, but it definitely got him through that rough patch. That's great. You know, um, a couple of things I might throw in here that we could talk about in the next little bit is also the connection between concussion and depression and how you deal with that. That's something that we've seen a lot of through our work with the Enhanced Protocol. And there were also some comments from one of the participants about general anesthesia in surgery and how that can affect cognitive functioning and mood and, and just overall demeanor with people. I responded a little bit in the chat to that, but um, there's definitely a lot in terms of how some bodies treat that like a toxic exposure. And for other people, when you go into general surgery, you've got prophylactic antibiotic usage. And Randy talked a lot about gut health and what antibiotics do. And just to be clear, nobody's saying there's never a place to use antibiotics, that antibiotics have saved countless millions of lives. But we do need to understand how the gut works and how to protect gut health. So there, there's a few topics there that we can talk about as people yeah. have questions. Man, we could just go on and on and on. And, and I, I want to talk for two seconds about head injury. Um, I was at a meeting learning about a new pharmaceutical agent. This has probably been 15 years ago. And the physician teaching about this drug said, women typically experience depression in the form of being more emotional and more tearful and they lose sleep. Whereas men tend to express depression in terms of being mean and caustic and sarcastic. And he says, you can kind of tell them apart that when I see a guy who's just a big fat jerk face, I think, dude, he's depressed. And you made me think of that when you talked about concussion, because when you look at the research on concussion disorders and football players, the research shows that they have memory loss and they're mean. They just get grumpy and irritable. And I often think, goodness, I wonder how many of those things that we could adjust take that vinegar out of them. So that's a great point, Eric, on head injuries. That is great, guys. Eric or Randy, were there any other questions in the chat box that uh, you wanted to address? Um, I wanted to address one thing about anesthesia. Um, our liver is the number one organ in our body to help clear a toxin like anesthesia. And think of it, anesthesia is a toxin because it puts your mind to sleep. It takes you out of consciousness so you can't feel when they're cutting your belly open, right? I mean, that's a toxin. 
And we have a hard time clearing that toxin when we have other things that impair our livers. So think of individuals who have had their gallbladder up or they've had repeated gallstones and they just don't have good gallbladder flow. Think of individuals who are on 25 different pharmaceutical medicines that all have to be cleared by the liver. That's a big deal. Think about those same people then have two glasses of wine at night and that dramatically impacts the liver. So there's a lot out there from a toxicity standpoint that rides on liver health. So that's also something to keep in mind. Very interesting. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I certainly do appreciate your time and your insight. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people are gonna wanna be coming back to is they got little nuggets from this presentation, but they're gonna be saying, what was the rest of that? What was it? What were all those little details? So Randy, if you don't mind, I would love to be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation um, and be able, I will send it out to the participants just so no that problem. they can, they can share it and they can come back and pick up some of those um, extra nuggets that maybe they didn't get to write their notes down. I know that I was writing my notes um, down as well because yeah, like we'll I said, We'll send out a copy of the handouts. You know, when you save and print that, you can print handouts from your presentation and I'll send that out to you and then you can get it out to our participants. That is fantastic. Well, I do wanna thank everybody for joining us. If you do have questions or you wanna do um, reach out to any of our participants, um, please feel free to email me. That's Lori at the summit az.com or you can reply to one of the links um, that on um, how you got this information and I'm sure my contact information is on there and we'll be happy to connect you with either Eric and Randy or Robeson and again we look forward to our next presentation which is going to be on I think it's in February yeah we're coming up to February um, we're doing the enhanced protocol on Friday February 5th at 9 30 um, that's another great presentation. And then we have one on toxic buildup. So just like what Randy was talking about, but a deeper dive on toxins. And that's on Tuesday, February 23rd. So we certainly hope that you'll consider joining us. Um, you can look for all these webinars on our website on thesummitaz.com to register. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you soon. Thanks, everybody.